Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. It is my great honor to be with lesbian pioneer, icon, um, luminary, Judy Grand. Thank you for joining us, Judy. Thank you, Anne. It's always my pleasure. Well, I for those few of you who don't know Judy, I'd like to read a short bio, if I may. Sure. Uh, Judy Grand is a renowned poet, activist, mythographer, cultural theorist, and the author of works that fuel the GLBTQ feminist and women's spirituality movements internationally. A before Stonewall gay activist who walked the first picket line of the White House for gay rights in 1965, she later founded Gay Women's Liberation and the Women's Press Collective. Her intention with writing is to replace obsolete philosophies with better ones. I can get behind that. Her subjects range from LGBTQ history and mythology to feminist critiques of current crises, new origin theories of inclusion, what makes us human, taking racism personally and dismantling white supremacy, and stories of how to engage with creative minds and spirit. This is very abbreviated. You've also written 14 books and won a lot of awards and had awards named after you. Yeah. It's all very impressive. Um, one reason we're here today is to celebrate uh, the reissue of one of Judy's earlier critical works, The Highest Apple. Uh, but before we get to that, I'd like to um, be self-indulgent and have a little testimonial because I have a copy of, you know, Judy has one of the most powerful poems I've ever read. She wrote it in 1973. It's called A Woman Is Talking to Death. I can't recommend it enough. And I, in show and tell, have the early Diana Press edition with little, little uh, with the uh, pictures inside and it costs $2.50. $2.50. Now, if I may continue this narrative, self-indulgent though it is, I have um, my teaching notes from a woman who's talking to death. I don't know if you can see all my, mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to tell you that it's contained in the work of a common woman, which is where you can get it now. Uh, and I encourage everybody, it's really a powerful, one of the best poems I've ever read. So, um, now I'd like to turn to the highest apple and also be self-referential, if I may. I have here a copy of the 1984 edition, signed by the author in April 1985. <laughs> it's almost 40 years ago. Um, and I first you heard you read from it in Madison, Wisconsin, where I was a graduate student. And uh, you gave up fabulous reading. And then you went to the women's bookstore, Room of One's Own, which is still open and, you know, uh, serving customers. Yeah. But I was teaching. <laughs> so my partner bought me a copy and you were kind enough to sign it. However, because it, <laughs> you signed it, it became an artifact. And I didn't want to read it because I, I always write in my books. So uh -huh. I, had, I haven't uh -huh. read it, and <laughs> happily, it's been republished with revision. So let's talk a little, if we may, about its current incarnation. In 1985, Judy Grand boldly declared that lesbians have a poetic tradition and mapped it from Sappho to the present day in the groundbreaking book, The Highest Apple. In this new and updated edition, The Highest Apple, Sappho and the Lesbian Poetic Tradition, Gran revisits the original text with her characteristic ferocious intellect 
passion for historical research, careful close readings, and dynamic storytelling. It's all true. Um, Gron situates poetry of Sappho, Emily Dickinson, Amy Lowell, H.D., Gertrude Stein, Adrian Rich, Paula Gunn Allen, Audrey Lord, Peck Parker, and Olga Brumas as central to lesbian culture, and more radically, as central to society as a whole. The, this new edition of The Highest Apple, Sappho and the Lesbian Poetic Tradition, includes Gron's in-depth analysis of poetic work by her friend and comrade, Pat Parker, and suggests a transactional approach to poetry as uncovering layers of the self. So it's transactional in the sense that you transact between layers of the self? It's transactional, actually, um, that I'm meaning there in that it's a, a, a new point word, um, oh. describing la layers of ourselves that uh, that as we go through life as poets expressing uh, parts of ourself, more and more sections come uh, come to be revealed. And so that that and a woman is talking to death is an is a great example of that, of my self-examination of myself in relation to oppression, the whole subject of oppression. It was meant to be addressed to the left, which um, was abiding by Marx's, uh, Karl Marx's attitude toward LGBT people as um, self-indulgent dilettantes and, uh, and obviously, you know, belonging to classes that, that could not do a revolution. But we were in the process of doing just that. We did a, a revolution by attaching um, uh, lesbian energy and dyke energy, as we called ourselves, uh, to the women's movement, as well as uh, being a, a group of women who had engaged in social justice from a number of different uh, perspectives before, prior to that, uh, and that being 1969. And uh, you were one of the first people to coin that word dyke? Are they popularized? Yes, I, I did. I put that uh, on a, a book of mine called, that's called uh, Edward the Dyke and Other Poems. Instead of calling my book The Common Woman or some, something softer, um, I put the word dyke there because nobody was yet able to say the word lesbian. And, I, and they certainly fainted at the whole idea of the word dyke, which is um, even more... Um, Mm, even more exemplary of women's power than lesbian is. Um, so that was that was my tactic at the time. Uh, and I was urging uh, the lesbians that I knew uh, to engage with the women's movement. And we did, and we formed uh, lesbian households and started defining ourselves, talking about ourselves, who were we? in terms of anything and out of it grew a bookstore uh the press um there was a, a health movement um a health uh, center and um a battered women's shelter uh and many other uh services for women that would get women in general into the workforce get us retrained get us focus, get us to some extent educated in a woman-centered way. Uh, so that all happened and it was revolutionary. And uh, a woman is talking to death was a way for me to address oppression, but not by accusing, rather by saying, here's my place in it. Here's where I tried to reach across to other people. Here's where they try to reach across to me. Here's where it succeeds. Here's where it fails. Here's where I didn't live up to my own standards of how to get along with people who are different from me, which remains one of the world's big crisis points, doesn't it? How do we get along with those who are different um, from us? And a woman's place bookstore, you say, is the first women's bookstore to open in the U.S. Is that true? Um, I always said that to them. They were my housemates. Um, 
And and Carol Wilson always denied it. She said, no, there was a bookstore in Chicago that had been there for a long time, for a time before theirs. So to say the first, I don't know, but it certainly was the largest. And it was, um, I mean, people poured into that bookstore from uh, finally from around the world as they heard about it. It was more than a bookstore. It was, you know, people discerning what it is that women uh, wanted and and that they thought women needed and would buy and take home and treasure, but also they used small areas of the space uh, to uh, have performances, to have uh, people come and do lectures and meetings and, and share information, do uh, be in dialogue with each other. And in the same space, we had rented some of the space and we had our press, which had equipment, lots and lots of very iron, very uh, structured with rubber rollers and ink and kerosene and, you know, gears and all that and press, press that was, you know, nose high, big presses that we were printing women's material, including my books. And Parker's books, Pat Parker. The first book that I did of my own stuff, which was called Edward the Dyke and Other Poems, I did that on a mimeograph, a mimeograph that had belonged to the poet uh, Diane de Prima. <laughs> well, to be referential, again, my partner is a poet, and she has a signed copy of Edward the Dyke, and she said she really loved it um, because it was working class, and she's working class. Yeah. And so you know, there's a perspective there that wasn't heard often in the world. That's right. Of That's right. Our our movement, um, it really crossed all kinds of uh, class and race uh, barriers that had been set up in the society at large, and we broke th broke through them in mm -hmm. many different ways. So the daughter of a senator would be rubbing elbows with the daughter of a janitor, mm -hmm. and that's was in my work experience, that was a very rare thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it just didn't happen in the workplaces mm -hmm. that I was ever in, which were hospitals a lot, where the mm -hmm. doctors sat in a separate room and were given different food. And, um, you know, people were quite segregated by class. But let's get back to the book. Um, okay. Uh, Grant assembled this text in conversation with two younger lesbian poets, Alicia Mountain and Elise Knorr, demonstrating the continued relevance and dynamism of the highest apple for contemporary readers. A new introduction by Grant, a foreword by Elise Knorr, and editor notes by Alicia Mountain, along with six responses by contemporary poets, highlight the ongoing significance of the highest apple to readers, writers, and thinkers. So let me ask you from the get-go, tell us please the significance of the title. Oh, The Highest Apple is from uh, one of Sappho's poems. Um, and she describes um, that that there's a highest apple that the, the shepherds can't reach it. Um, and it's unlike uh, the purple flower, the hyacinth that is trampled under the shepherd's sandal on the ground. Um, you know, the, the apple pickers cannot get to the highest apple. And my idea, I was gripped by this because of the fact that, that our movement, and I wrote this um, to 10, almost, yeah, 15 years after we started our movement which was a separatist movement. We separated from everybody. We separated from all, you know, all kinds of other movements that we'd been involved in the, who wanted us to stay and do, the, you know, all kinds of labor with them. And we didn't do that. We were a little, little country unto ourselves in a certain way. Um, and so the idea that there was an, an apple on a tree that no one could reach it and that it was itself unto itself was very gripping 
for me. And especially as I was reading these poets and they were talking about islands and <laughs> continents and and there seemed to be a commonality of um, expression of what it meant to be woman-centered in a patriarchy. Um, how did you happen to write this and publish it in 1984? Well, I had, by, by 1984, uh, I had um, I had finished writing a, a sort of I call it a warm wet history. Uh, it was it included it was a very eclectic all over the map book, um, based in words that I had heard uh, to describe gay and lesbian people, or had been called on the street, or that were bar terms that I had learned. And we just learned the terms and not anything about where they might come from. So I decided to investigate where they might come from and kept running into um, ideas and references and mythologies that implied that at various times, these, these words had been historically important. They had been even uh, part of sacredness in mythology that and that there had been and was in cultures all around the world um, designated jobs or positions or places or names for uh, people who were homosexual and as I would later come to term them transgender uh, didn't have the word transgender at the time so I just called everything gay because when I came out, everything was called gay. Everybody was gay. The drag queens were gay. The lesbians were gay. You know, the upper class gay men were gay. Everybody was gay. But um, but then as, as feminism developed uh, a decade after that, as part of this movement that I'm talking about, gay women's liberation, um, we came to give gay to the men uh, because we could understand the differences between um, what lesbians wanted to talk about and do with our lives and needed to do with our lives and what the gay men were doing. Uh, they were very different approaches. And yet, of course, the commonality of the oppression and of the movement and in other ways as well. Uh, so men came to take the term gay, gay men, and women took the term lesbian, our sapphic or dyke. Um, so there we were with the new language. And there then, you know, years later in 19, in the early 1980s, I'm researching like mad for another mother tongue. And it came out and I had always thought that there needed to be a lesbian piece of this with the lesbian poetry, but there just wasn't room in that book. Um, and so another mother tongue came out uh, and was a raging success, may I say. And so then I immediately sat down and in a very short time, I wrote up The Highest Apple and was fortunate that somebody published it but I think it was a more controversial than another mother tongue because um, it didn't go very far out in a direction. I think the idea of a working class poet doing something literary like that was an unusual approach. And I, I had, of course, built my reputation as a working class person, <clears throat> not as a literary person. And yet here I was suddenly quoting HD, who is not exactly, she's not accessible. She's so brilliant, but but not generally accessible in the same way that uh, the poetry that that myself and and my peers were putting out, including what Audrey was doing and Adrienne, Olga and um, Pat and Paula, the contemporaries. We were trying to be uh, accessible. And so we weren't drawing a lot from mythology and HD did draw from mythology, which puts adds a, it adds a layer of understanding that you 
one needs to have to understand the poetry. That's a strength of your book that you're able to talk about those things and analyze them. Yes, and, and hoping that, you know, by putting some snippets in, I can interest people in delving more deeply into what this poetry is. Because the only thing anthologized are her images poems, you know. That's you right. Know, but she was somebody who was able to combine an epic sensibility with lyric poetry, and that's that's really an accomplishment. And one other strength of your um of the highest apple is that your attention to language comes through. And so, you know, often I felt delight. Oh, I didn't realize placenta came from place. I should have thought that evil came from Eve and so forth. So that is a delightful dimension that I'd like to highlight. Since oh, you're talking. You. Yes, but you need to understand that I'm, I have a, a playful, quirky sense of um, humor and of uh, just taking command of things. I just became, and we we were all like that. We were just rebellious. We didn't use um, apostrophes, for example. <laughs> uh, I don't know why, but we just didn't. And um, so I would take that kind of thing with a little grain of salt. You know, I wouldn't take it literally. Mm -hmm. I would say oh, something that Judy wanted us to explore. Oh, the possibility that this goes back to women because so much goes back to women. And at the time, I hadn't done all of my life's research to know just how much does go back to women's practices. Um, so I was I was being very daring, uh -huh. and, uh, including that I was saying that HD was a lesbian. Nobody was saying that. Nobody was saying Emily Dickinson is a lesbian. There might have been one or two literary books that had come out that suggested Emily, that she was in love with her sister-in-law um, and she had an affair with someone named Pate. But um, but really and truly, nobody uh, who, in, who was writing about Emily Dickinson mentioned that she, <laughs> that by the way, <laughs> this, this um, passionate love work was not dedicated to her male editor, it really was um, very deliberately written for one or the other of her two woman lovers, uh, including her sister-in-law. So tell me, how did you happen to revise and republish it now, The Highest Apple? Well, it, it had been out of print. It went out of print about four years after it was published. And so I sort of forgot about it. I thought, oh, well, it maybe it wasn't very well written. You know, I just was self-disparaging. And then um, then uh, Julie Enzer, who is just magnificent. Do you know who she is? As a uh, prime sure. mover, editor, writer, poet. Right. Um, and, and she she approached me. She said, I want to redo this book. And would you go along with that? And would you work with these editors if I get these younger editors? So she's the one who got eight younger people to do their commentaries, uh, do the editorial uh, suggestions, you know, that they had and, um, and do the new introduction and afterward and so on. Um, and and um, and then set up uh, a, a Zoom video panel of us reading the work and talking about it and so on. So I you know, I was not going to say no to that offer. No, it was spectacular. It took some time, and my motive was that I had left my very dear friend and comrade. Pat Parker out of the book. And I had done that because I had a truncated view of spirituality. You know, I, I'm credited with being a foremother of women's spirituality with the She Who series. Every, all of the poets that, that I initially worked with um, in the first edition had something, even Adrienne had something that overlapped with some idea or another 
of spirit, of afterlife, of something over on the other side is conscious, something like that, whether it was called a goddess or not. And it was only called a goddess by the people who had goddess traditions, like Aud uh, Audrey went to Africa, um, came back with names of uh, of female deities that she had run into there and proceeded to use them. Um, Sibylisa in her in her poems is one a mother goddess. And Oya, she talks about Oya, the wind warrior goddess of Yoruba tradition. And and when she did her um, her her biomythography, uh, Afrikati was a, an African deity that she called on as somebody that she was lovers with, or she, the character, was lovers with in, you know, downtown New York City. Um, so, uh, and Paula had access to uh, names of deities from her own background as, uh, through her mother, Native American uh, Laguna Pueblo, um, so, so she had a couple of names, and then she also could uh, was a scholar of native uh, materials. So she had uh, an another concept, a really just gripping concept um, of of God as what we do. But Pat, nothing. I searched her work, searched her work, searched her work, searched her work. And just finally had to say to my limited self at the time, I just don't find anything spiritual, which was a real oversight on my part because people called her the preacher. Um, and, and when I finally was able to concentrate on what Paula had said in her work, God as what we do, I said, well, if there's anybody who did God, it's Pat Parker. And so I was wrong to, uh, I needed to go back and find a way to integrate her into this work. And so that's what I, I spent a year doing um, while, while Julie was rounding up uh, all of the comments from these younger authors, I was figuring out what parts of Pat to put in here, how her letters to Audrey and Audrey's letters to her, how they could be integrated into this book and fit her into all the chapters. So there you are. <laughs> so, because I wondered about the relation between materialism and spirituality and the reconciliation is that spirituality is what you do. Is that how you arrived at that um, conclusion? Oh, that's, that's one that, that was uh, that's one uh, part of it. You know, I think that there are as many definitions as there are people writing about this, I would guess. But I didn't stop after Highest Apple. I continued um, being very interested in um, and what I was calling um, deity, female deity at that point was love. Uh, and... Uh, partly because Aphrodite, Sappho's goddess, is goddess of love. And because uh, Helen of Troy, who became a goddess, became worshipped afterwards and still has a temple in Greece, uh, in Sparta, the island of Sparta, um, she was all involved in love. And, uh, and then I was graced by uh, being given copies of material from the ancient Sumerians. And this is like uh, 1600 years before Sappho. Uh, there were other poets who were writing about a goddess of love named Inanna. And I have been on her trail now for, I don't know, 35 or 40 years or maybe longer. And so- uh, You got a book about it. Well, yes, I published one entire book about her stories, some of her, eight, eight of her stories, and they are just marvelous stories. 
Um, and now I'm I'm working on even more information about her. And I would say at this point, the relationship between um between materiality and spirit is the relationship between wave and particle. That they are interchangeable. And I would go further to say, and I'm sure there are others who have said things like this, that uh, that life, if it's conscious, and to me it seems to be conscious, it is in dialogue with itself and uses material forms to do that. Meaning not only it, that life as consciousness is in dialogue with itself through us, but also learning through us as we learn. So it's like that. <laughs> Well, and you say that um, all of the poets you discuss don't, um, all their gods are pantheistic, that they kind of reject a monotheistic deity. And um, I find that very interesting. And also that none of their gods are omnipotent. Yes, that is what one of the things that I believe is a difference between um monotheism the, the god is omnipotent not not in all monotheism but in patriarchal monotheism and patriarchal families you know the father is omnipotent um or the one who speaks in behalf of everyone and the god is omnipotent and has a plan and so on i don't detect anything like a plan in any of the uh, stories that pertaining to uh, various goddesses or or mother uh, deities or mother sister or sister sister uh, combinations in people's mythologies. It seems much more to be interactive. And um, I'm sure you recall the era that's still existing in certain lesbian circles of goddess worship. And you kind of back off from the idea of the goddess. Would you mind talking a little about that? Well, the reason I did that is that, you know, in in America, being this capitalist um, economy that we have, everything becomes commodified. Everything becomes individualized and commodified and sold and boxed up and named and defined and then has T-shirts and <laughs> paraphernalia around it. Um, and I didn't want to go down that road. I wanted to stay uh, in a more metaphysical place and a more exploratory place and hopefully a more inclusionary space, but one that was that really was not going to say that individuals are goddesses, um, although individuals can become goddesses in some in some village goddess traditions, um, but um, but rather that uh, we need to be paying attention to the consciousness in nature and not be so concerned with ourselves and elevating ourselves and, you know, adulating ourselves and, and so on. And to do that, you have to stay in a state of not knowing and in a state of trying to find out and in a state of interacting with difference. And how did you happen to choose these 10 poets? It's really a broad array. And oh, it's I may just, odd. I'm yeah. so glad you focused on beginning with O. That is one of my favorite collections and it figured centrally in my life. I wooed my partner 41 years ago with a poem from that collection. Yeah. I mean, Olga Brumis, I think is just you know, and I don't know how famous she is, so I'm delighted that you talked about her at length. Oh, she's just sterling. And she's so lyrically beautiful. And yes. beginning with O was was such a and pastoral jazz. I loved that book also. And she had also she was drawing from she's Greek American. She was drawing from an authentic pantheon passed along through her own people. Uh, and that's I think that shows, you know, in her work. So 
you know, these this particular group of people uh, that I chose, first of all, I knew them. We were in community together. Uh, so I lived with Paula Con Allen, was living with her at the time. I wrote Highest Apple. That was in the 80s. In the 70s, my close poetry comrades were Pat Parker, Audre Lorde, and Adrian Rich. And we traveled to each other's houses, um, traveled back and forth between the coasts as Audrey and Adrian were in New York. And Pat and I uh, were in the Bay Area um, together in California. Uh, but there was a lot of back and forth. Pat stayed with Audrey. I stayed with Audrey. Audrey stayed with me. Audrey went to visit Pat. Uh, early on when Pat was still living in San Francisco. So, uh, and and there were moments that we overlapped in other ways, read together um, uh, and used each other's work. So Audre Lorde uh, taught A Woman Is Talking to Death in, in the early 1980s. Um, and, you know, we wrote about each other's work and obviously I wrote about their work. It was, this was my chance to do that in The Highest Apple. So that was the contemporary people. And then uh, of the, the older ones, I was interested in their relationship with Sappho because they had read, and I was interested in their relationship with how, how do you be woman-centered in a patriarchy? How do you do that? And they did it through their women's companionship that they had. Not only uh, lesbian relationships, and in Emily's case, it was very uneasy what those were. She, it's not like she left her father's house and went to, went to Paris to live with Kate, uh, for example. She just didn't do that. And the sister-in-law was married to her brother. Um, so they were intensely close but in relationships that we, in our newfound um, sexual interactive public glory, might not even have recognized as all that lesbian. You know, we would have said, oh, closet, closet, um, because that's what it was. Nevertheless, in her little group, uh, Emily read Sappho. Uh, H.D. wrote about Sappho. Uh, Amy Lowell also, she had um, things to say about goddesses and um, and roses that, you know, ro you know, there were certain themes that kept coming up. Roses was one of them um, that it attached to Sappho. So that's why I, I, uh, I sort of put them all in the same category. Uh, for myself with a commonality. And the, the the younger writers, their critique was that that I'm not broad enough in Highest Apple. But I was as broad as I knew how to be. I didn't know of any other poetry. You know, I wasn't someone who read German or, Fr or, Fr or French or Spanish. Um, I did I did a pick up on um some a reference to a I, I think it was a Chinese woman writing to her lover and a <clears throat> medieval uh, French uh, nun writing to her lover. And I, I put those things in there, but I just wasn't there was no internet. There was no, you know, we were limited by what we could know at that time. And so I didn't do that. Who's your audience now, would you say? Well, uh, I I gave a reading of from the highest apple in in New York at the New York um, City Public Library, and I some like something between 150 180 people showed up. Um, most of them were 50 and younger, I would say. Um, there were. Uh, 
there there were trans men there were trans women there were um straight men there were um somebody who was 20 and had uh found my been taught my work in high school and when she was 16 you know and there were a, a few uh, gray-haired dykes who wanted to tell me <laughs> we were we were the the Lexington Dykes, and do you remember anything about us? And we, uh, and I, you know, so we had an exchange. There were people who said, "Well, I recorded you uh, back in 1974, and here's the recording, and I just I brought it for you, and so on." Oh my so, gosh! Yeah, uh, gay men who had done that, or a lesbian who had done that, and so on. So it was it was mixed, and. Um, and very, very heartening. And I think probably uh, spurred to some extent, maybe to a great extent, by Julie Enzer's wisdom in ca calling these younger voices in and having them comment, how, having them say, what does this book mean to you now? You know, where is is the value in it? That And, and how, what does it mean to you? Um, and what would you what would you say that Ron didn't measure up? And I saw that I went on Zoom and I listened to it a couple of times. And even though I couldn't see that there were 150 people there, I could feel that the audience was so receptive. I mean, it looked like a really powerful event. Yeah. Um, but speaking of the respondents, um, you have the six respondents and I have great admiration for uh, them reaching out to do this, you know, and taking the time to do this uh, and, and write their thoughtful responses. Uh, and it's, it's so heartening to see that uh, for them, it seems as if there is this knit together tradition, you know, that there is a way that this work speaks and speaks not only to the people that traditionally I thought of as lesbian, but speaks more generally to a broadening of that category and to people who um, who would say they're not lesbian. Let's go back, if we may, to the She Who poems. Okay. Um, which you, um, when I heard you read them, they were so lovely and there was such momentum and so inclusive. Um, and you say they're conjure poems, but anyway, can you talk about them as conjure poems, please? Well, okay, uh, you know, sometimes I say things and then it takes me years to understand why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm pretty sure that I knew uh, that what I wanted to do was to somehow, um, surround uh, some sense of a spiritual uh, component to to being female in this in this patriarchy and and uh, and attachments to nature of various kinds and of um, breaking some of the stereotypes of ways that separated women at the time so you know the that series ends with a poem that starts the woman whose head is on fire, uh, the woman whose toes grew together, the woman who never smiled once in her life, the woman, you know, who screams on the trumpet, the woman who eats cocaine and so on. That list is very dynamic. And I, I, I was trying really hard uh, to, um, to make a commonality <laughs> out of um, a lot of divergent of, uh, ways of being. So that, you know, the woman with enormous knees, the woman who is part giraffe, but it's like just um, to be as inclusive as I could be um, and, and without naming anybody and without naming any culture or any time or era or period or anything like that. So I came through, a, and, and that uh, series, I went to Gertrude Stein to uh, 
figure out how to do it because Gertrude Stein had managed to do that very thing, uh, living in, in France, um, alienated from America for whatever reasons, uh, economic being part of it, lesbian being part of it, I think, I would guess. Jewish maybe being part of it as well. I don't know. Um, but she, she gripped the English language from its roots. And she loved grammar, had studied grammar. And she went to grammar and proceeded to take the language apart. And I I just was like uh, awed, and I remain awed that she was able to do that, that she was able to um, describe people that she knew in terms of uh, their rhythm. You wrote a book about her, too. I did. I wrote three essays about her, and, and she remains a touchstone for me. So for she who, I went to that. I went to how do you describe something from the po point of view of rhythm and changed how I walked. I changed how I, um, I, I think I wrote with my left hand. You know, I, I, ch I tried to change my rhythms. <laughs> I tried to um, uh, make up sentences that had rhythms that I hadn't, been using before and just to see what would happen and would the content change because of that and, and it did so I called it conjuring but now after having written about Stein and I, I then said what she was doing was calling without naming and that's another way of saying process philosophy I think <laughs> that she was uh, going in the moment she was in the moment and that's what she said a rose is a rose is a rose meant that the rose was different every time you heard it and so that was another way of describing a rose was just calling its name um but but calling without naming was something that she really did with the language that she um she took the tiny words, you know, that are the connectives and and made paragraphs about them in which they were central. Um, so she was equalizing the relationships uh, and subject, object, sentences disappeared under her pen. It was just remarkable. Uh, and another way of thinking, a, a valuable way of thinking, in my opinion. Um, speaking of, um... Let's talk about commonality. Okay. Common women and um, how it relates to, talk about the idea of commonness, if you wouldn't mind. What you say is about your contemporaries, our, um, our work seems at times to dance. Yes, it, to dance with, its, with each other. Yes, the, work, yes. the work itself seems at times to be dancing um, with with each other. Um, but commonality came to me initially in 1969 when I had tried to join a women's consciousness raising group that was meeting. And one of the people in the group when I said I was a lesbian, went into a stereotype place. And, and as she told me at the end of the meeting, she spent the meeting thinking that I was going to get up and jump on her. Oh, that's much common in another sense of the word. That it's is crazy, isn't it? It's just, it's just, it's like, oh, crazy. You know, and then I also went and thought, oh, she should be so lucky, you know, <laughs> putting myself back together because it hurt me. Yeah. I was hypersensitive at the time. We didn't, hadn't defined ourselves. We hadn't formed uh, Gay Women's Liberation. It was still three months away. Right. Um, but I wrote, I went home and I decided to write my own consciousness raising group. And I called, I, 
I ended, I, I built it around uh, um, deconstructed sonnets. And at the end of each poem, uh, it says the common woman is as common as something. So as common as the common crow, as common as a common nail, as common as um, good bread, as common as wine, and so on. Um, and each of the women were very different from each other. They were just quite different. So the commonality is that the poet said they had this in common, um, that they they had qualities in common. And I tried to knit that into the work by with cert repeating certain colors, maybe certain phrases. Um, but the idea was they were all in this series of poems together, and that gave them commonality. <laughs> You were reclaiming it too, because you know you clarified the difference between common man and a woman being called common. So that's right. Very, yes, that's it, because that's a striking difference. The common man um, from the nineteenth century uh, was a you know the man who labored in the fields or the man who labored in the factory. Uh, and, and that the era would be of of his commonality, which did come true in the labor union. The labor unions, and they got their idea of union from marriage. So that's how tight they wanted to be and needed to be in order to pull off a strike, uh, which can go for months and months and months. And who is going to feed the kids during all of that time? And, or maybe the the laborer is in jail um, or tied to a fence or, you know, something awful is happening. And so the union as, as a form of marriage is very, very striking. So... Um, and then the idea took off because you... Then, were, I'm sorry. Works of the common woman and then... Adrian Rich wrote Dream of the Common of a Common Language yes, and yes. Common Lives Lesbian Lesbian Lives. I mean, it became a, a common trope in uh, lesbian culture. That's right. But the common man was was nobilized right. you know, by poets in the 19th century. And the common woman that has um that ha that's more than just saying that she's working class or lower class or has no class. It's also implying that she is sexually available to any man who wants her. And so she's a slut or, um, or maybe she even um, charges money, in which case she's even lower on the social scale in that definition then I wanted to break all that open. I wanted to change it. I wanted to be somebody who could um, change the definition of what a common woman is and turn it into something um, real, real women's lives, courageous, uh, smart, um, spiritual, uh, and worthy. That was that was the chore, and the, the people picked up on those poems. They memorized them. They took them everywhere. They sold them on the bus. It was really extraordinary. There was no distribution at the time, let alone anything like the internet, and so people carried them and wrote them on walls. Um, they and named things after them and quoted them and misquoted them on posters and t-shirts and all kinds of places so it was an idea whose time had, was ripe uh and, and you know my poetry just carried this message out into the world and um at the end of it i i'm swearing an oath to women to see them through all of us that we would rise and that's been a life lifelong troth that I made that I I have still have my eye on. 
I'm still and doing that. We'll rise together. It became a bonding. Yes. Hope, you yes. Know? Yes. Yes. This was not about uh, the individual. Um, this was not about women becoming billionaires either. Um, this was, you know, commonality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's one definition of it. And yeah, you're right. And that, uh, that uh, Adrienne picked up the dream of a common language, which is a beautiful phrase. Uh, and people named bookstores. And then later, um, I'm not sure who first said it, but Audrey was talking about common differences. And that is a very, very important part of this that we need to concentrate on common differences. How do we, um, you know, how do we make that strong? How how do we make that be something that we can dedicate ourselves to, uh, to be honest about differences and not run away from them, attempt to understand ourselves and others in, in the commonality of difference and then find our our strengths and what what we need to do in common going forward to solve the massive problems really that we are facing as a species as a country as um white people as you know people of color as native people um as the earth comes after us in so many ways because of the damage that we're doing we we continue doing uh, and and so on and and that's not to say there aren't many many people trying to reverse that damage there are and that's really positive and good news but everybody needs to get on board what are you working on now well I'm working on um uh, the third book length poem that I've written about this on the subject that started off is with Helen of Troy and uh, Homer, uh, 1200 BCE, and uh, then went to contemporary times, but making use of an older mythology from the Sumerians um, in Queen of Swords, uh, and that became a play, Queen of Wands, the first one that became a play. So, so I decided Queen of Cups, which I'm working on now, I should, I'll just make it a play. But it's eco-poetic, it's full of poetry, and I'm writing the best poetry I can possibly come up with now. And wonderful characters. Uh, and the plot is that... Um, there's a character who is an osprey. He's half osprey, half man. And his osprey relatives fish all the waters of the world, and they've told him their problems in all the waters of the world. And he's concerned, so he's called a conference of the elemental goddesses to come with their companions and their values from and tell us who they are, tell us some stories, and let us um, decide what of what they are bringing needs to change, what is of value, what is is being restored that was lost for all these 4,000 years or 2,000 years um, that we could um, fold in feminine voices and voices of variant gendered voices and find out what uh, men's part you know is in uh in what's happening um and how do we proceed from there uh you know as as a group not as a group but as um in in a states of commonality of uh a union with nature itself or herself or himself or however you want to describe who we live with it's trying to also it's also trying to blend my understanding of science with my understanding of mythology uh, so that there's an objective and subjective approach that we can have to where we live. Judy Gron, that's a very inclusive, wonderful vision. And um, 
I really appreciate your joining us and uh, good luck with all your future projects. We'll look for it all. Thank you.